you know, there was one thing I neglected to remind you about or tell you about, and that is that in the lobby, we have mail slots. If you're a regular attender here, even if you're not a member, you should have a mail slot. And if you have given in support of the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church here this year, you should have a thank you gift in your mail slot. So I want to remind you just to make sure to stop by the mail room and collect that today. I think you'll really enjoy what we have for you. Um, we're going to continue our series on miraculous births this morning. And I want to kind of remind us of, of what we've covered so far. What we learned is that God created a good, 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 very good world. And that through the misuse of their choice, our good world went in a, in a catastrophically bad way as a result of Adam and Eve's decision. And God promised to, to resolve that catastrophe by sending a descendant of the woman, by sending a descendant of Eve, and that descendant would come and solve the problems of death and chaos in our world. Okay, that's the big idea. And that, uh, that, that woman's descendant is not just going to come from any family. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, which family was that baby going to come through? It was going to come through the family of... Abraham. Okay, excellent. Some of you said David, but we'll start with Abraham, right? It's Abraham, and then Isaac, then Jacob, then Judah, then David. But we got some A students in the room. So God has promised to, to restore a good world and bring to end death and sin and, and to resolve the chaos of our world. He has promised to resolve all of that through a descendant of the woman and she would come through the family of Abraham. And so we studied Abraham and the miraculous birth of his child Isaac. And then we studied Isaac and the miraculous birth of his son Jacob. And now we're going to study Jacob and the miraculous birth of his son, Joseph, okay? So in order to kind of pick up the story of Jacob and the birth of Joseph, we kind of need to talk about who Jacob was. Now, as you recall, Jacob was, his birth was miraculous. He was going to be born a twin. He was born Jacob and Esau. And you may recall from our message last week, if you were here last week, and or if you watched online, greetings to those of you that are watching online and at Community Estates, that God had promised Jacob would be born second and Esau would be first. And you may recall that Esau came out and Jacob came out hanging on to his heel. And those boys grew up, and as they grew up, Jacob had a real desire for spiritual things. Jacob grew up longing for the blessing that God had promised, the blessing of the firstborn. In fact, he was so hungry for that spiritual blessing that he was willing to be a bit conniving in order to get it. His brother Esau comes home from the hunt one day, ravaged with hunger, and, and Jacob asks him to sell his birthright for a pot of stew, and Esau is willing. Later, when it appears that Jacob's father, Isaac, was not on board with God's promise blessing to Jacob, Rebekah and Isaac cook up a plan to steal the blessing, to deceive the father into giving the blessing. And you know, like so often happens when you cook up a plan to lie and deceive, there are unexpected consequences, right? And so he cooks the plan up and they deceive the father into giving uh, the blessing to Jacob. And as soon as Esau finds out Esau is as mad as anyone has ever been. Esau wants to kill his brother. And so mom, what does mom do? I mean, she's got a son who's a raving lunatic who wants to murder her other son. And so she says to her son, Jacob, get out of here for a few days. 
while your brother cools off. And so Jacob sets off on his journey. And that night, he's worn out, he's scared, and he lies down to rest for the night with nothing but a rock for a pillow. Can you imagine the son of a wealthy man, homeless, with not a penny in his pocket, with a rock for a pillow? And while he sleeps, he has a vision. And in that vision, he sees a ladder connecting heaven and earth. And he sees the angels of God ascending and descending. And and the message that God sends to Jacob through this ladder connecting heaven and earth is really simple. You are not abandoned. Heaven and earth are connected. You're running scared for your life. You're a lying, deceiving scoundrel. But heaven and earth are connected, and I'm here for you. Now, in the book of John, we learn that the ultimate connection that that ladder symbolized is Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the one that connects heaven and earth. It says in John 1, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That there is a connection that God does not abandon us. We'll pick the story up in Genesis chapter 28, verse 13. There above the ladder stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. He goes on, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you, and your, what's this word here? Offspring. Here, God renews the promise that he made to Eve. You will have a descendant. And the promise he made to Abraham. You will have a descendant, and through your descendant, the whole world will be blessed. Now, to Jacob, he comes and renews that promise. Look, man, you are not abandoned. There's a connection between heaven and earth, and I want you to know that you will have a family, and through your descendant, the entire earth will be blessed. It goes on, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Jacob had blown it, He had lied, he had deceived, he had wrecked his family, and yet the Lord comes and says, I've not abandoned you, I'm with you. In spite of what you've done, I am with you, and I'm going to still work through you. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob continues his journey and he winds up at his uncle's house. His uncle's name is Laban. And you may recall, Laban is a superficially nice guy who has a corrupt, greedy heart. And so Laban graciously takes this young man in and this young man, Jacob, begins to work for his uncle and And Jacob notices that Laban has a daughter. He actually has two daughters, but the younger daughter is, she's a stunner and catches his eye. And so Jacob and Laban discuss what's going to happen and they make an agreement that Jacob will work for seven years and at the conclusion of the seven years, he will marry Rachel, the younger daughter who is beautiful. Now, there's a couple of things we need to make important notes about here. Number one, women were not bought and sold in the Old Testament. People, people read this story and they think, ah, oh, see, the Bible is this patriarchal, uh, male-dominated, terrible book where women were bought and sold like cattle. That's not what's happening. 
In fact, to put a little finer point, that's a very anachronistic reading. That's reading the present into the past. Here's what happened. It was impossible to live on your own in the ancient world. It was a violent, brutal world, and women tend to be smaller than men. Women did very poorly if they lived alone because of the nature of society. And in order to ensure that women were safe and secure when they were married, typically the man paid a dowry. He paid a, a significant sum, sum of money that went to the woman's father and that money then came from the woman's father back to the woman. And that money was her essential, it was essentially an insurance policy against marrying a dirtbag loser. Right? I mean, because there are no divorce laws. There is, there is nothing to protect. There are no societal structures to protect you if you marry a dirtbag loser. And so, essentially, by, by providing a dowry, the man is saying, number one, I can produce income and I can produce wealth and I can save money. And if I abandon you, you have a nest egg with which to care for yourself. So it's not men buying women, it is men and women entering into a relationship that has protective boundaries for the woman in case the man turns out to be a dirtbag. Okay. Incidentally, that's maybe a reason to go to college before you get married, right? That's insurance against a dirtbag. Please don't, that, that doesn't make me sexist, does it? Okay. So Jacob works these seven years and there is this incredible line here I absolutely love. He says, Laban says, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel and notice what it says, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Okay, everybody's supposed to say, oh. That's like the most romantic line in the Bible right? The only other line in the Bible that comes close to being as beautiful and as romantic as this is the one in Song of Solomon that says her neck is like the Tower of David. <laughs> I think this one exceeds that in its beauty. What's fascinating though is when Jacob's mom sent him out fleeing from Esau, Jacob's mom said, listen, be gone a few days. A few days later, he meets this woman, spends seven years working. At the end of the seven years, what's he say? It felt like only a few days. Identical Hebrew words in the original. Now, fast forward to their wedding day. The seven years are up. Jacob is exceedingly thrilled and excited to be marrying this woman that he's passionately in love with. They have the wedding, they, they have the party, they go to do the kinds of things that people do on their wedding night and he wakes up the next morning and he rolls over and he looks at the woman that he is now married to and lo and behold, it's Rachel's ugly sister. And he is completely freaked out. Now, I don't know how this happens. Maybe she was wearing a veil. During the wedding? During the party? During the post-party activities? You know, every night when I go to sleep, I put on an, a, a sleep mask. Does, did anybody else do that? They're amazing. I put a sleep mask on every single night. 
and like halfway through the night, I get claustrophobic and feel like I'm going to die and I tear the thing off and throw it across the room. Every night, I cannot go to sleep without the thing on, but I cannot stay asleep all night with it on. So I wonder if that's what happened. If she like wore the veil to the wedding, wore the veil to the party after the wedding, wore the veil during the post-party activities, and then halfway through the night, she was like, this thing's making me claustrophobic, tears the thing off, uh, and then he, and then, or maybe, maybe Jacob made the mistake that many people do with drinking too much at the wedding. We don't know. But somehow he wakes up with the wrong woman in his bed. And so he goes to his father-in-law and he's like, Laban, what, what's going on here, dad? And he says to him, we don't give the younger before we give the older. That must have felt like a knife in Jacob's heart because he just lied to his father about being the older when he was really the younger. The deceiver was deceived in the identical way he deceived. And so dad says, well, look, you work another seven years, I'll give you the girl. And so he gives her the girl and then he works his seven years. And now he has two wives and we pick the story up here in Genesis 29 verse 31. And I'll tell you, I actually think the end of Genesis 29 and the first half of Genesis 30 are the saddest. It's, to me, it's the most heartbreaking section of Scripture and for Thanksgiving, I thought I would read the saddest verses in the Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. The word Reuben means to see. And now I want you to listen to what she names her son. Or she says, surely my husband will love me what? Isn't that heartbreaking? You've got this poor woman who's married to a man who doesn't love her, and she thinks, oh, now that I've had a baby, maybe now he'll love me. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I'm not loved, he gave this one to me. So she named him Simeon. Again, the Lord heard I'm not loved. Again, heartbreaking. Again, she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. Levi means attached. Again, you hear the heartbreak in this woman, child after child, name after name, expressing her desire for connection with her husband. Again, she conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I'll praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Judah means to praise. Then she stopped having children. I suspect, she's a fertile woman, obviously. She had four children in a row. When it says she stopped having children, I think, and we'll see this later, it may imply something like he stopped being with her. By the way, Judah, Judah's the family line through whom the Messiah will come. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister, so she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God? Who has kept you from having children? Then she said, here is Billa, my servant. Sleep with her so that she can bear children for me and I too can build a family through her. So verse 4, so she gave him her servant Billa as a wife. Jacob slept with her and she became pregnant and bore him a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me 
and listened to my plea and given me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan. Dan means vindicated or judged. Now, now it's interesting to me when, when Rachel begins to have children through her servant, she does not name the children these tragic names, although the names are tragic. Because you can see this name is judged Essentially, she's saying, God, you judged in my favor against my sister. You vindicated me against my sister. And you'll see that again in the next child, verse 7. For some reason, I'm not advancing. There we go. Rachel's servant, Billah, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, I have had a great struggle with my sister, and, ha- and I have won, so she named him Naphtali. Now, I want you to notice, Rachel, uh, Leah is naming her children these heartbreaking names. Oh, God, why won't my husband love me kinds of names? Leah is... Uh, Rachel's naming her children names that basically say, finally, I'm having kids and conquering my sister. Does this sound like a happy home? One wife not loved having children. One wife loved having children. Two women surrogates. That's the polite way to say it. All right, verse 9. When Leah saw that she had stopped having children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Verse 10 and 11. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then, sorry, I forgot to delete Genesis there. Then Leah said, what good fortune. So she named him Gad. Leah, I like Leah. I li- she's obviously a really pleasant human being, isn't she? She's like, oh, I had another kid. I'm so glad. We'll call him Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, how happy am I? The women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. During the wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrake plants. They they believed that mandrakes were an aphrodisiac and a fertility drug. Okay? So both the women were interested in it. One was interested in it for the fertility reason. The other was interested in it as an aphrodisiac. During the wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields, found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother, Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said, he can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. And that's why I think we know that that Leah was not having children because she had been kicked out of the bed. But now here's the deal. Essentially, if you give me the mandrakes, I'll give you your man for the night. Verse 16. Who said the Bible didn't speak to modern issues, right? (laughs) So when Jacob came in from the fields that evening, Leah went out to meet him You must sleep with me, she said. I have hired you with my son's mandrake. So he slept with her that night. God listened to Leah, and she became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. So she named him Issachar. Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has presented me with a precious gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I have borne him six sons, so she has named him Zebulun. After six children, she is still in a place of absolute heartbreak and desire to be welcomed as a loved wife. And then it says, sometime later, she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. And that is the miraculous birth that we're focused on. She then has this son, Joseph. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add to me another son. Now, I want you to imagine you are first Jacob, then 
Joseph. You want nothing more than to be spiritual and to honor God and you want nothing more than his blessing but then you make a tragic mistake of seeking to get that blessing through dishonesty, through cheating, through lies. And now you're running from your brother, you're running away, and, and you, are, you are a fugitive who never sees his mother again. You're taken in by your cheating uncle who deceives you into marrying the wrong girl, who then marries the right girl, who then has four women that he's juggling, 13 children, and then your kids. They're quarreling constantly with each other. Then your daughter Dinah is raped your beloved wife dies in labor with her second child. And then your son, your son Joseph is, 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 you think, dead, but in reality his wicked brothers have sold him into slavery in Egypt. Now, imagine you're Joseph. Here you are. You're just a kid, right? I mean, you're just a kid. You want to be happy like every kid wants to be happy. You want to have a happy home like every kid wants to be happy. But here you are. Your brothers have feigned your murder and sold you to slavery, and you are now in Egypt working as a slave, and then you are falsely accused of, of rape and imprisoned then you get out of prison and you rise to second in command. And I asked myself this question as I was thinking about this message. Why is there so much energy devoted to Joseph when Judah is the one through whom the Messiah comes? Because almost a third of the entire book of Genesis is devoted to Joseph. So why so much to Joseph when he's not even in the messianic line? And the answer is that Joseph in Egypt organizes the society in such a way that he saves all of Egypt and all of Israel from dying in the famine. So that from the family of Jacob the family of Israel, could come this child through the tribe of Judah who would bring blessing to the whole world. Okay. Here's bottom line. And I, wanna, I, wanna just, I want you to think about your own life for a moment. Mistake after mistake, family problem after family problem, disappointment after disappointment. That's what we see in this story. And then we see they are never abandoned by God. Mistake after mistake, family problem after family problem, disappointment after disappointment. And in the end, it's just simple these people are absolutely never abandoned by God. In fact, God is faithful to these people because God wants to bring the Messiah through these people. And the Messiah makes a way for all of us to be blessed, for all of us to have our mistakes completely and totally forgiven through Christ. God makes a way through the Messiah for the restoration of our broken world. God makes a way for through the Messiah for all things to be made new. And so, so here's the bottom line message. What have you done in your life that leads you feeling like 
I've made mistake after mistake. My family has suffered because of it. My life has Maybe you got taken in by your crazy uncle and he ripped you off. And you've been disappointed and angry about it for years. I, I once met a guy. He said, I work for the airline working on airplanes and they were doing this dirty stuff and I reported it and they fired me and I've been working at these junk jobs. I was an airplane mechanic making 25 bucks an hour and ever since I was honest and did the right thing, my life has been terrible. I've been working these $10 an hour jobs for the rest of my life and he was angry and he was bitter and he was disappointed in life and I don't know what your life has brought you with disappointments and brokenness and ugh. But I know that God through this story is set, sending us a message. Whatever your disappointments are, whatever your discouragements are, whatever your sense of tragedy and abandonment are, God is with you like he was with Jacob. God is with you like he was with Abraham. He's with you like he's with Joseph. God has not abandoned you. In fact, Jesus says it in these words, and I'm gonna end right here. Jesus said, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God is radically committed to this world God is radically committed to this world, to bringing this world to its purpose, which is the restoration of all things through Jesus Christ. So whatever you're going through, my friend, whatever you're in right now, the disappointments, the heartaches, the brokenness, I want you to know that Jesus Christ, the great and glorious God of the universe, has redeemed your failures through his death on the cross. He's redeemed your sin through his death on the cross. He has made a way to liberate you from your guilt. He has made a way to empower you in the present, and he has made a way to restore all things. And in the meantime, he promises, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And so for this, I am thankful. In the pew in front of you, there is a connect card. I'd like to invite you to take that out. Give you an opportunity to respond on the connect card. You can put down whatever prayer requests you might have, whatever interest you may need to express, whether it's interest in, in the church, if it's interest in committing your life to Christ, if it's interest in being baptized, you're welcome to put all of those things there. And on the Connect card, I want you to write, my next step is. My next step is, it says that at the top, and then you can write this after that. To trust in a God who will never abandon me. My next step is to trust in a God who will never abandon me. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, maybe if I could get this straightened out, then God would be with me. Can you imagine Jacob trying to think that crazy thought? How do you ever untangle yourself from four women? That you're, that you're married to. You got to trust yourself to God and let God untangle life for you. So in a moment, the deacons are going to come forward. When they come forward, they're going to collect your connect cards and any offering that you want to give. If you want to give to something other than uh, if you want to give to something specific, you can indicate that, whether it's church budget or tithe or love in action, you can indicate those things on your um, connect card or on your um, offering envelope. If you'd like to give to conference advance, just throw your money in the basket. Deacons, please come forward.
Let's stand together. your blessing. May our hearts be filled with thankfulness. Father, as we look at the brokenness, the disappointment, the discouragements, Father, may we know that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you do not abandon us in the midst of this. This, whatever it is, God, you don't abandon us. You showed your commitment to humanity was so great that you, were, that you would rather die for us than live without us in heaven. Father, may we be filled with gratefulness and joy because of your commitment to us. In Jesus' name, amen.